Hey guys, how's it going? I am Julian, a former practicing corporate attorney, graduate of Harvard Law School, turned mental health advocate, entrepreneur, content creator. I'm wearing a lot of hats right now, but that's not why we're here. We're here because I worked in big law, which is the high level, prestigious, very, very bougie side of the legal profession for a couple of years before I quit to focus on mental health and do other things. And I get a lot of questions about how accurate is the show Suits? both in terms of the professional characteristics, the legal side of it, and also the culture and how people interact with each other. And so we're gonna watch the show together and I'm gonna give you guys the inside scoop. Before we do, it would mean a ton if you guys would smash that like button, hit that subscribe, it really helps our team. Every little thing matters, takes you three seconds. Much love, let's do this. I check. Raise 5,000. I'm all in. I gotta say, I was never invited to these poker parties, and I don't think they really happen on the West Coast. This seems to be more of an East Coast old guard thing. East Coast law firms tend to be more traditional and old school. And now, you won't close until we take away the last shred of his dignity? Bingo. Well, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> and why the hell not? Because I like Mr. Cooper, and my firm doesn't operate in bad faith. Oh, I see how it is. Lawyers will always look out for themselves. You're working Cooper, you're working always. me, or I'll pay someone else your money to do it for me. This is true. First Lawyers are fungible. Gonna touch this deal after your bad faith, you're mistaken. The way our agreement works is the minute Cooper signed the deal which gave you everything you wanted, our fee was due and payable, which is why at 7.30 I received confirmation of a wire transfer from escrow indicating payment in full. Okay, I want to pause and discuss a couple things. First of all, in law, remember, it's a client-driven industry. The client will get what the client wants. So in this scene, this client's being very unreasonable. It's it's all about the ego, right? Like I want to just screw over this other party when it's not even necessary. And Harvey just go like, okay, well I calm down, you know. And it happens a lot where lawyers, especially in big law, will have to talk their clients out of doing things that are just bad for the business, bad legally, sometimes just bad morally. Uh, and lawyers very much are that sort of guard in between <laughs> some of the some of the bad acting that occurs. Of course, uh, they don't catch everything. Second thing I wanted to discuss is this scene right here where Harvey says, actually, since the deal was signed, we already got paid. Our law firm's good to go. Not how quick law firms get paid. Typically, it takes weeks, sometimes months, depending on the clients. Sometimes you never get paid, depending on how fun the client is, uh, for the law firm to get paid after a deal like this. And certainly not after the signing. Just for your benefit, there's two moments that really matter in a deal. There's signing and then there's closing. And so for many deals not all but many signing is when the parties agree on the terms in the agreement closing is when the actual money gets wired or the merger is consummated or the event takes place that the signed agreement contemplates so i'd say the ball's in your court but the truth is your balls are in my fist <laughs> now i apologize if that image is too pansy for you but i'm comfortable enough with you gotta love harvey put it out there you let him talk to me like this harvey speaks for the firm Nice boundary setting, Jessica. You love to see that. Don't let your clients treat you like that. That's not what most big law attorneys do, I gotta say. In the pandemic, man. 24-7-365, that's when attorneys answer calls from clients. We got paid before Gerald signed the deal. What are you talking about? This is a memo about some fire drill on two. Yes, see? You're the blue team captain, you get to wear a fire hat. He was bluffing. Because that's not when the firm gets paid, like I said. So, ship. <laughs> This is interview week, right? You think that I'm We're getting into big law. I have ever seen interview for our firm. Uh, uh, because I have an appointment. <laughs> That's so mean. Donna's so mean. <laughs> First of all, this is how it works to interview to get into big law. Every law school will have a week at the beginning of typically the second year of law school where you interview with like 30 to 40 different law firms. And each of these interviews is maybe 15, 20 minutes. It's mostly a screener. So it's like, tell me about yourself. like. Tell me about your background. It's more of a personality check. If it goes well, you progress into the callback phase, which is typically five to six attorneys, 30 minute interviews each. So, you know, two and a half, three hours. What we're seeing here is that first phase, that early interview week where you have all the students in the school hustling and running from hotel room to hotel room, just trying to, you know, make it and uh, leave, leave a good impression. <laughs> Executive assistants like Donna are the right hand of many attorneys. They do a lot of different things, administrative tasks, advising, scheduling. They help keep the attorney afloat. Donna and, and Harvey, I will say, I think have a very unique relationship. Though. You can do this. Was that me before an interview during 
Early interview week, maybe. <laughs> what is wrong with you? You look like you're 11 years old. I was late to puberty. Thank you. I respect you. I think this is supposed to be taking place in New York in the show, but in reality, the interviews take place at the campus of the law school. Hi. Uh, how do I sign up for today's law school tour? You go back in time six weeks because that's when it booked up. <laughs> We get over 7,000 applications a year. You think you can just walk in and take a tour? I believe our acceptance rate's around 9%. And, uh, you can walk the grounds of the law school without a tour, by the way. It's not that big. Wasserstein Hall is the big one you want to check out. It's very new, it's very nice. It has the portraits of all the faculty that are tenured lining the walls. Congratulations. Okay, so I just wanted to make a note. The way that this guy dresses, like with that you know, sort of uh, vest and the nice the nice suit jacket. Many law students dress like that. They dress up just to go to class. I mean, it's school, right? So you don't have to, no one's forcing you. There's no like dress code, but I think law students generally dress a little bit more up. Uh, I was certainly not one of them. I will fully admit I wore sweatpants, uh, Nikes and uh, Timberlands uh, to class on more than one occasion. Mike Ross, hi. Oh, look at that view. I'm Rachel Zane, I'll be giving you your orientation. Wow. If you go to New York Big Law, you'll get a nice view. We can get it out of the way that I am not interested. No, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't hitting on you. Trust me, I've given dozens of these, and without fail, whatever new hot shot it is thinks that because I'm just a paralegal, that I will somehow be blown away by his dazzling degree. Let me assure you, I won't. I was. Mm-hmm. Rachel's awesome. You. you were. Take notes, <laughs> I'm not gonna repeat myself. Harvey's your commanding officer. However, Louis Slit, he oversees all associates, so you'll also answer to him. What do you think about Harvey? Here's how it works in a law firm, right? Managing partner or sort of sometimes there's a CEO, but rarely, right? Managing partner, senior partners, junior partners, senior associates, mid-level associates, junior associates, staff. You can't see the hand, but staff and, and paralegals and, and folk. Let me also say that as you're gonna find out in the show here, the way that uh, Rebecca speaks to Mike, being a paralegal, there's often this friction where the paralegal knows a lot more than the lawyer. And they've done work for 30 years and you know, you walk out of law school, you don't really know anything, right? And so these attorneys come in and some of them just don't give paralegals the respect that they deserve because they think, oh, you're just a paralegal, right? You're not a lawyer, even though the paralegal literally knows more law <laughs> than the associate. And it really pays off if you treat your paralegals with love and kindness and respect and honestly look to them as a teacher because that's really what they are. And if you don't, the paralegals aren't really going to like working with you. They're going to work with other people. And paralegals are in very, very high demand because they do good work, they're efficient, and they're very knowledgeable. They say he's the best closer there is, but I have very little contact with him, so I don't know. What about Louis Slit? Let's continue with your tour. One other thing. They, they, they refer to Harvey as the best closer attorney for I presumably corporate law in New York in, in this show, which I always find interesting because from my experience in corporate law, there's not really a sort of attorney that comes in at the beginning or the end like that who closes the deal. Usually, if you're the partner of the deal, you run the whole thing beginning to end. There are specialists who come in, like let's say tax specialists, employment specialists who come in and help out on certain parts of the agreement. So they, they fly in, they fly out. But I haven't really seen a sort of corporate attorney that comes in just for the very end. Although law is very specialized, it could exist somewhere. Hey, Becky, you're glowing. I wonder why that is. Oh, yeah. It's the day they announced my promotion. Jimmy, have you lost weight? Steve-o! That's a very busy hallway. Came to work. I saw probably three people at the same time when I was a big one in the hallway. I got a work order to take it off. Senior partner, junior partner. Is that a thing or not? In this show, it seems like they refer to different partners internally as you're a senior partner, you're a junior partner. From what I have seen, you don't externally refer to yourself as a senior partner or a junior partner in the industry. If you are talking to a client, you're a partner. Now, internally in the firm, there is some sort of unofficial nature of who's a junior partner and who's a senior partner. But even then, I have not seen it actually change the titles of the partners. Typically, everyone is just a partner. If you're a partner, you're a partner. And maybe you know offhand, oh yeah, that guy's been here a long time, he's a senior. Oh, that person just made partner last year, they're more of a junior partner. You haven't taken one note. It's because... Because you were too busy ogling me to listen to a word I've said? <laughs> <sighs> Partners offices anchor the wings. Fifth floor is research, six is security. All work gets billed, even if it's finding an address. 
I answered a Harvey That's and true. Lewis Lit, and judging by the way you responded to my questions, I should admire Harvey and I should fear Lewis. You have been here for five years, and just because I outrank you does not mean I have the authority to command your services. <laughs> oh, it's also pretty clear that you think you're too smart to be a paralegal. You know what nobody likes? Nobody likes a show off. <laughs> you use the word ogling. <laughs> Two things. First, she said that you bill for anything, even time spent finding an address. Yes. You bill as an attorney in big law, and I'm sure in mid law, small law as well, for any time. If you if a client calls you with one question, it takes seven minutes, you bill seven minutes. If you respond to an email and you're writing up the email in response to the client's question, you bill. If you do research offhand that is related to the case, like finding an address, finding a phone number, etc., you bill, you bill, you bill, you bill. If a client requires you to travel, you will, in some cases, bill the time that you spend traveling, right? You always bill. That is just the way that the model works. The second thing I was gonna say, there are not cubicles like this for New York big law attorneys. Typically, you have your own office if you're a New York big law attorney or California big, in general, if you're a big law attorney. In New York, some offices require you to have an office buddy because real estate is expensive in New York. And so if you're a junior associate, you might have two people in the same office and you share it for a couple of years until you're a mid-level associate, then you upgrade and get your own office. But in no event have I seen these sort of cubicles. Although I will say, I know some law firms like Cooley are moving towards a more uh, progressive look and feel of an office and some of those have these sorts of open spaces. They're not necessarily cubicles, but the idea is that attorneys are gonna work more like tech companies now where everyone is in the same room together. I'll do my best, Mr. Docker. You got a nice server there. Working on it. <laughs> what the hell is this? It's you having sex with a woman who isn't Mrs. Dockery. <laughs> you trying to blackmail me? Trade her your preferred shares, which have no voting rights, for her common shares, which do. The preferred shares are worth $2 million more. A fraction of what you'll lose if you get voted out of your company. John, I don't care if you sleep with every woman in the Hamptons. Just give her the preferred shares. That was smooth. On the legal side, what he said was true if the company was public. So preferred shares, generally speaking, in public companies, do not have voting power. Instead, preferred shares have, for example, higher access to dividends. They have a guaranteed sort of payment structure where if the company distributes funds, the preferred stock will get it first. If there's a merger and there's a payout, the preferred stock will get paid first. Again, this is in the public company context. Let me take a step back and tell you guys something about the private company context. And what is the difference between private and public? Well, private companies are those that are listed on a national securities exchange, for example, NASDAQ, NYSE, right? Private companies are those that are not. I'll give you an even simpler way of understanding this. If you can buy a stock of a company just on Robinhood or any of these apps, it's a public company, right? If you can't, let's use TikTok as an example, okay? TikTok is still a private company. You can't buy shares in it. Well, the way that the structure works in private companies is typically investors who come in and venture capital firms usually who say, hey, I'm going to give you a million bucks for 10% of your company, right? If you've seen the social network, you know kind of how this works, right? The shares that those venture capital firms are going to get are called preferred stock typically. And that layer of preferred stock in the private company context, those shares have a lot more power than the common shares that the founders and the employees of the private company have. Those layers of preferred stock, they have special voting rights, they have special veto rights, they get paid first if a company is bought, and of course they can vote. And so I wanna make clear in that scene, they were most likely talking about a public company given the fact that the preferred stock didn't have voting rights because in the private company context, Preferred stock have much more than voting rights. In an affidavit stating you paid Ms. Webster to falsely testify. This is the pro bono case. Harassment is a civil violation. The penalty is money, but witness tampering, that's a crime. And you will go to prison where I guarantee you'll learn more about unwanted sexual advances than you can possibly imagine. Do you think this is going to intimidate me? Even if this evidence was credible, who are you going to get to prosecute a small time witness tampering charge, huh? Harvey, didn't you graduate law school with the current U.S. attorney in New York? In fact, I did. Okay, so they're talking to the counterparty here, which is the CEO. It's a pro bono sexual harassment case. And I want to call out prosecutorial discretion because what that CEO just said is very true. Just because you commit a crime doesn't mean you're going to go to jail, does not mean you're going to be charged ever. That's never a guarantee in our world because in order to actually be charged with a crime, you need a prosecutor to go out and press charges on your case. Prosecutors have way too many cases. We just don't have enough prosecutors and resources to hit every single case. 
So there's a thing called prosecutorial dis discretion and prosecutorial discretion is exactly what it sounds like. It's the prosecutor's choice on who they want to prosecute, when they want to prosecute and where they want to put all of their resources, right? And so in this context, the CEO is like, what are you gonna do? Like, this is a small time case, no one's gonna charge me. And Harvey's like, well, it's my best friend who is literally the prosecutor down the street, so I can just call him and tell him. Now, is that the most ethical thing? Probably not, but will the CEO be able to do anything when he's being charged with a crime that he actually committed? Also no, right? And so this is this is unfortunately a very real thing in, in the power structure of the legal system that exists, is the more you know people, the more you have those personal relationships, the more power you will intrinsically have because of your network and your influence. With that, let's watch this guy get dunked on. And I think he might even be interested in pursuing a case like this. Wait, are you two still clubs? Well, I was the best man at his wedding. Wow. <laughs> You're bluffing. Let's see. Yeah, here we are. Must admit, I, I look very dashing. This is me and his mother. You, got, you just gotta love Harvey. Let me know if you're Team Harvey or Team Lewis in the comments. There's only one right answer. But he can't put guys like you away from Harvey. sexual harassment and then go to strip clubs now, can he? Fine. And a raise. Oh, oh, okay, all right. Are we done? The kid should be able to grow up without the burden of tuition hanging over his head, don't you think? Which is why you're also gonna pay Nancy an extra 250000 They're settling the case right now. Charles. Gentlemen. 98% of legal cases end in settlement and do not go to trial. This is one example. In this show, in this pro bono case, they didn't go to trial with a full jury. They didn't present evidence. They didn't do oral arguments. Instead, they had a couple of court hearings. There was a little bit of discovery. Discovery meaning we're going to look into the files that the other party provides us to analyze and do some research. And boom, they settled and now the case is closed. And we just don't have the, the resources to take on every single case that exists out there. And most of the time, parties will end up getting drained by the costs of lawyers and settle anyway. So if you're ever considering hiring a lawyer out there to like press on somebody or to threaten somebody, I very much encourage you to just try to settle it out of court because the only people that are gonna win when you guys sue each other, it's the lawyers. That's it for me, guys. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. If you have just one, just one, one second. If you could smash that sub button, smash that like button, and drop a comment. Let us know what your thoughts are on the channel, on me, on this suit, on Suits the Show. We'd love to hear from you. Every little thing helps. We cannot thank you enough for your time. See you around. Much love as always.